So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us yet again. This is actually the final webinar in our series of three. The previous two, if you missed them all, want to recap, are uh, available on our website. Um, we've got the usual presenters of myself, uh, and for those that don't know me, I'm Duncan Bailey, and I head up the private client team at Bradner's. Uh, we've got uh, Helen uh, from Bradner's family team also, and uh, uh, Moira from FPC. But in this webinar, as we're looking to the future, we thought it might be quite appropriate to introduce some of the younger members in, uh, in our respective teams, uh, so we can get their perspective too. So, uh, in this webinar, we're also joined by David McGurnham from the private client team of Bradness. Hello, morning. We've got, uh, right on cue, we've got Natalie Dixon uh, of the Bradness family team. Hello, everybody. And finally, we've got Helen Thomas, a chartered financial planner from FPC's planning team. Morning, everyone. So the private client uh, team at Bradner's and the family teams are two of the core elements of what we call Bradner's Personal, which is a coming together of all of the services we offer as a firm to clients as individuals rather than businesses. And that ranges that's ranges from everything from wills, powers of attorney and trusts, to family advice, to employment, to uh, residential conveyancing. So any service we provide to individuals as our clients in their own right. Now, with the slightly different format in this webinar, we're not going to be answering questions in the webinar itself as we have done in the previous two, but do ask them, and as we have done previously, we'll answer those in the follow-up as usual. So, without further ado, uh, and if Moira is ready, I'm going to pass, her, pass you over to her, uh, and she can give us a quick recap uh, on our family and what we've covered so far. Moira. Thanks, Duncan. So for those of you who joined us in sessions one and two, you'll be familiar with our family by now, but let's take a little look at our family tree anyway, just for a quick recap. <clears throat> so in webinar one, we focused on grandparents Thomas and Sarah. Uh, retired and in their early 80s, they've got a good solid pension income, and that's thanks to Thomas's long and successful medical career. And that's covered all their needs and allowed them to help their children, Claire and John, with substantial sums over the years. And they've also gone on to help fund their grandchildren's education too, out of surplus income, which has been very efficient from a tax planning point of view. Now they're downsizing to move nearer to their daughter, Claire, and in the process, they're gonna be releasing half a million pounds. What we've been able to show is that they can afford to do that without undermining their own long-term security, and they can address any long-term care needs they might have. And that money is gonna be split. Half of it's going to their son, John, to help him rehouse and get back on his feet after his divorce. And the other half is actually going to Claire's side of the family because they've always treated them the same. But we're gonna skip a generation and let's go on, go on to her children, who are Sophie, who's married to Steve, with a little baby girl and one more on the way, and the other part to Fred, their son, who's about to get on the housing ladder too. Now, the reason for that is because Claire and Peter have got very different financial circumstances. They've been married 30 years this year and they're just about to sell their business. So their financial situation is changing a lot, particularly their inheritance tax position. What they're concerned about is also their long-term security, but they want some protection for any gifting that they might think about for their children. Now, this week we're going to talk about John. Um, but before, as I say, do watch the first two sessions, as Duncan said, if you want to sort of recap on our stories and it brings all that planning to life. John kept his pensions post-divorce and he's got around £150,000 in a small SIP uh, and he's got his pension from IBM from years ago. That kicks in when he's 65 and his state pension kicks in at 67. Other than that and a bit of cash, that's about it. So he is starting from scratch. Now, over the series, we've introduced you to something called an AIMS model, which is a tool that we use to build lifetime cash flow models to help clients look ahead answer the question how much is enough and make some good decisions and we're going to look at john's aim model now and what you can see from this first chart unfortunately is a sea of red on the far right hand side this is john's income and expenditure graph what we can see in those early years the blocks in gray is him working he earns about fifty thousand a year and that's enough to cover his day-to-day -day expenses his current rent 
and his child maintenance obligations. The black line there is the income he needs, the gray block is what he's got. So as you can see, there isn't a lot spare. What that means is when it comes to retirement, he rattles through his savings and pensions pretty quickly, which is the orange block you can see. And then we're all we're left with is the IBM pension and his state pension. So the reality is that John is not only reliant on gifts from his parents, Thomas and Sarah, to help get back on the housing ladder, he's also reliant on their estate long-term for his own financial security. So let's look at that. Now in the second chart that you see here, we see his estate and how that progresses over time. The bottom, you see a blue block, which is him getting back on the housing ladder, buying a property for about 250,000, and that broadly holding its own with inflation thereafter. His small amount of pensions and savings are allowed to grow, and then you can see a substantial amount coming into the estate in a few years' time. What we've done here is we've fed into his model half of his parents' estate net of inheritance tax. And those who watch webinar one may recall that with the planning that we undertook, that inheritance tax bill ended up with less than 10% of the estate. So what we're thinking about here is what's very important is not only does John protect that 250,000 gift, but also we need protection for the future inheritance that he might receive. So Helen, how's things looking for John from your perspective? Thanks, Moira. Well, the positive here is that in his divorce, John got what we call a clean break settlement, which means that Jenny cannot pursue him for any more money, either during the rest of his lifetime or from his estate on death. So what, what looks like a very bleak picture now, no capital, has actually bought him the opportunity of preserving any cash and additional pension provision that he builds up again from this point on. So what he has got to be mindful of, and indeed the wider family, is to make sure that the financial choices which he and they make going forward are made with the idea of wealth protection in mind. Now, we all know quite rightly that life moves on. So if he does meet a new partner, then he needs to think about having a cohabitation agreement or a prenuptial agreement in place so as to ring fence assets. And he should also think very carefully about how any new property is purchased, for example, in his sole name, or if he is to buy it in joint names, then make sure there's the requisite declaration of trust in place to protect his share. But one other point to think about is the crucial importance of regularly updating your will. So Duncan will just explain what does happen to an existing will on divorce. Duncan. Yeah, thanks, Helen. So, um, so John will need to update his will. Uh, on a divorce, uh, any gifts that you leave to uh, your former spouse or for the purpose of this webinar, I'll include a civil partner there. Uh, they would then fail and that spouse would be struck out as acting uh, as an executor also. So you will, is still technically valid um, uh, and almost operates as though your spouse had predeceased you, which in uh, an acrimonious divorce possibly else wish you, what you wish would have happened. Um, so despite that, often the will, even, even uh, taking account of that, needs properly amending though. Uh, and do remember, though, that uh, until the divorce is finalised, of course, any gift that you've left to that horrible spouse will still take effect. Uh, so it's vital to change your will as part of your divorce. So uh, John, as, as Helen mentioned, uh, may uh, 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 get a new partner. And let's, let's assume he has. And the longer he's with that partner, the more possibility there is that he might want to leave uh, her or him uh, something uh, or provide for uh, for them, but naturally, it, naturally, he ultimately wants his estate to go to uh, to his children. So, if he leaves assets direct to this new partner, they're going to belong to her and will pass in accordance with her will or, or her uh, intestacy rules, which we'll come on to in a minute. But essentially, um, those assets would then pass to her family, thereby disinheriting his his own children. So for this reason, trusts uh, in wills are very common where there is a second marriage or a second significant relationship like this. The trust, uh, which I've gone into uh, more detail in, in in webinars one and two, so do have a look back on those. But the trust can provide for the new partner for a period of time uh, or even her entire lifetime 
but thereafter the terms of the trust itself will stipulate that the estate then passes to John's children. So that's John, but do his children or indeed his sister's children need wills given they're uh, relatively young? Well, if, if you die without a will, rules called the intestacy rules will apply. And for the children, uh, or indeed anyone without their own children uh, of their own or spouses or again civil partners, their estate will actually pass to their parents. Now this can cause problems where the parents are already looking at paying inheritance tax. For example, looking back at Claire and Peter, which we covered in webinar two, the lifetime gifts that they were looking at making to, in particular Fred, who of course doesn't have a spouse or any kids, would backfire pretty spectacularly if Claire and Peter ended up surviving the gifts by the requisite seven years for inheritance tax, only to find that then Fred dies before them without having left a will, and the gifts then flow back into Claire and Peter's estate. And just as an aside there, people often assume that if they don't make a will, all of their estate will just simply pass to their spouse. But that's actually not the case. If they also have kids, their estate will get a divvied up between their spouse and their children in prescribed amounts, which is almost invariably not suited to what they actually wanted to. So it's always, always vital to have a will in place, even if you think that the intestacy rules or some other rules would sort things out. So talking about money going in the wrong direction, uh, I'm going to pass over to Helen to touch on some family planning issues as regards to that. Thanks, Duncan. There are just a, a few points that I'd like to reiterate, um, if I may. Um, one thought for parents and grandparents to bear in mind when looking at their financial planning and getting monies out of their estate for IHT purposes is always to ensure that the younger generation then protect the funds in their hands. And the main issues there are Firstly, think about property ownership. I, I touched on that in detail last time, uh, as well as a few moments ago. Um, but make sure that you protect unequal contributions to a property purchase um, by having a declaration of trust in place, setting out respective shares. Um, if any new partner comes to live in your home, then make sure you regulate your ownership of the property and make it clear that any new partner won't automatically get a share of the property. And also think about having a cohabitation agreement, um, setting out who is going to pay for what. Um, if you're thinking of marrying or remarrying, then do think about a prenup or indeed a postnup if you're already married to give yourself the best chance of protecting any disparity in wealth just in case things don't work out. I'd now like to hand back to Moira, if I may. Uh, Moira, can you elaborate, please, on the basic building blocks that people should keep under review from a financial planning perspective? Sure. Um, there's, a, there's a very simple analogy that we use um, to represent financial security, and that is a concept of a three-legged stool. And think of those three legs as being uh, in a position where you've got a decent cash reserve, you are debt free or have a plan in place to become debt free. And finally, that you've got a source of a long term projectable income that you can rely on. Now, for our grandparents, Thomas and Sarah, they were very fortunate to have a really good, solid, guaranteed pension income, final salary provision, which sadly is a thing of the past for many of us. And for Claire and Peter, of course, they'd sold their business. So they had capital to reinvest and also quite chunky pension funds as a backstop. But for John and Sophie and Fred, um, their future security is going to have to come from a fairly disciplined approach to regular saving and they're going to have to try and look to use pensions and other tax favoured wrappers to make the most of that and realistically they've got to live within their means just like their parents and grandparents. Uh, they also want to make uh, sure they think about what might go wrong and have some simple insurance cover in place. They're going to have their mobile phones and laptops insured but probably not themselves. And so they can think about having insurance to cover a lump sum, which can provide that cash reserve and get rid of any debt or mortgage mortgages. And they can provide an income stream either on death or in the event of ill health. Uh, and if they start early, it's cheap. So for Sophie and Steve, for example, half a million pounds of life cover might cost them less than 20 pounds a month. Whereas for John, it's probably three times as much as that at least. 
Um, now, obviously, I'm aware in their situation, they have got potential trust funds that they can rely on, gifting from parents, grandparents, and the potential beneficiaries in, in various estates. So they're in probably a fortunate position compared to many. Um, which brings me back to Duncan, really, Duncan. Can you just recap on the issues around those trusts? Because it's a big part of the planning here. Yeah, so we talked about um, trust in, in the other uh, webinars and how these might be created to uh, assist in estate planning for firstly Thomas and Sarah, didn't we? Uh, then there was John, uh, then Claire, and now even the grandchildren. So uh, following webinar two, actually, we did have a question about the running of trusts and in particular the taxation of them and the costs. Now, the downside with trusts, we've alluded to the, the myriad of advantages in, the, in these three webinars, but the downside with trusts is their administration. Depending on the assets that go into them and are held within them, this could involve the completion of tax returns, uh, possibly accounts, uh, and there should be trustee meetings held. Now, there can also be inheritance tax charges uh, during the lifetime of these trusts. But given these are usually less than 6%, it's generally seen as attractive compared to a potential 40% charge that might be uh, arising if the beneficiary held those assets um, themselves without the trust. However, uh, it's probably important to remember that actually many of the reasons we've been mentioning trusts over these last three webinars was as much to do, if not more to do, with protection of the beneficiaries themselves rather than just tax saving. Helen, um, do you want to recap before we uh, uh, introduce our next gen, so waiting in the wings? <laughs> Absolutely, thanks Duncan. Um, what we hope we've demonstrated in our three webinars in the context of our family is that it does pay to take joined up advice and not just from a peace of mind perspective. We've calculated in terms of lifetime IHT planning that a total of £1.7 million has passed and been protected down the generations. And if we factor in the value of the trust for business assets on death for, say, either Claire or Peter, then that shelters another £1.75 million, ignoring any future growth on those assets. Um, we're also talking here about 1.6 million pounds of potential tax savings. So hopefully that does illustrate the benefit of the time, cost and effort in taking specialist advice. Um, from the family law perspective, then I've been involved over the years in many cases where the existence of a prenup has meant that in a later divorce, there's been a straightforward remedy um, where the agreement is converted into an order quickly and cost efficiently. Um, by contrast, sadly, I've also been involved in many highly contested divorces over the years where the costs can be many thousands of pounds with months of stress and upset. And the ripples of that do affect all the generations um, in a family. But what we want to do now is to look to the future. And to that end, Moira Duncan and I, and I <coughs> excuse me, have invited colleagues in our respective teams to give a few insights into the landscape of the future. So I would like to introduce once again David McGurnigan, who's a partner alongside Duncan in our private client team. And David is going to talk about possible IHT changes. David. Thanks, Helen, and, and good morning, everyone. So in terms of future uh, potential changes to inheritance tax, uh, in the last two years alone, there have been three separate reports published on that topic. The most recent report uh, was published in January of this year by a group of MPs that spent some time reviewing the tax system, consulting uh, various professional bodies, and they came up with their own recommendations on potential re reform for inheritance tax. I'm going to pick out just two of the recommendations in that most recent report, but I should stress that what I'm about to talk about are only proposals and so should not necessarily be seen as current government policy. The first recommendation I'll mention relates to lifetime gifts. You'll all be aware, but current rules state that if I give an asset away, I need to live seven years from the date of that gift for its value to fall outside of my estate for inheritance tax purposes. 
In addition, there are a number of uh, allowances that I can use in relation to my lifetime gifting, such as the annual £3,000 allowance, the small gifts allowance of £250, gifts in consideration of marriage, and gifts for my surplus income. Well, the recommendation in the report published earlier this year is that the seven-year rule and those allowances I've just mentioned would all be abolished and instead replaced with a single annual gifting allowance of £30,000. The intention is that if you give away more than £30,000 in a single tax year, then there would be an immediate inheritance tax liability on the excess at a rate of 10%. The second recommendation I'll briefly mention relates to how inheritance tax would then apply on death. Again, you'll be familiar, the current rate of inheritance tax on death is 40% on my taxable estate. The report proposes that the rate of inheritance tax is reduced from 40% to 10% on the value of my taxable estate up to the first 2 million, and then 20% on the balance of my estate above 2 million. However, the point to note is that other than the spousal exemption and the charity exemption, the only inheritance tax allowance available on death would be what they call the death allowance, which the report suggests is capped to say 325,000 for a single person or 650,000 for a married couple or those in a civil partnership. So some basically um, it'd be capped at the amount equal to the current mill rate band allowance. So whilst the rate of inheritance tax will be reduced from 40% to 10%, you also need to bear in mind that various other reliefs and allowances would not be available, such as business property relief or the residence nil rate ban. Just putting that in context, if we think back to Peter and Claire in our family case study from web webinar two, you'll recall that they owned business assets worth around three and a half million pounds. And so these proposals, if implemented, would adversely affect them. Their business interests could incur an inheritance tax liability on their death of up to £700,000 if they were subject to inheritance tax at 20% on their death. Whereas currently, under present rules, there is no such liability as they enjoy full inheritance tax relief. In summary, whilst the recommendations may appear radical and make for interesting reading, uh, the reality is that they're only suggestions at this stage and so we shouldn't panic too much but rather simply take note. That, that concludes what I was going to mention today so I'm going to pass over to Helen at FPC who's going to briefly flag some potential changes to pensions and capital gains tax. Helen. Thanks David and hello again everyone. As David said I'm going to briefly cover some potential changes to pension and capital gains. As I'm sure you'll all be aware, tax, taxes can change from year to year as budgets come in. Each change can impact different members of the family in different ways. We've seen a lot of changes in the last 10 years following the credit crisis. And so it's not too presumptuous to think that there could be further changes in the next 10 years following the pandemic and in the wake of Brexit. I'm going to touch on a few possibilities that have been suggested. Firstly, let's look at pensions legislation. There's been a call to change the tax reliefs of saving into pension for some time. Currently, you receive tax relief based on your income tax rate. But there's been repeated calls for this to be scrapped and replaced instead with a flat rate of relief, for example, 30% for everyone. There's also been calls to replace the lifetime pension allowance with a lower annual allowance, which would, which would obviously impact the amounts that you could build up into your pension each year and ultimately the amounts of pension that you could build up over your lifetime. This would impact our grandchildren in the family tree especially. As Moira said, saving for retirement and pensions alone could potentially become a greater challenge. Next step is the tax treatment of pensions on death. So David's already talked about the possible changes to inheritance tax, but as we've seen in webinar two, when we focused on Claire and Peter, there are inheritance tax benefits of pensions as they sit outside of your estate for inheritance tax purposes. However, pensions do have a strange income tax treatment, which means that if you die before age 75, then your pension pot can be passed to a beneficiary income tax free. Whereas if you die over 75, then any income that that beneficiary takes is taxed at their highest marginal rates of income tax. 
A possible change could be doing away with the pre-75 age rule and making all withdrawals subject to income tax regardless of the age of the pension member when they died. This would impact Peter and Claire's financial plans as considerations will need to be made as to how, when and if they access their pensions during their lifetimes. So still on pensions, the state pension might also be in the spotlight again in the next 10 years. We've already seen changes to the state pension age and the introduction of the new state pension. Peter, Claire and John, for example, will not be able to claim the state pension at the age that their parents did. And it's likely that the grandchildren will be closer to 70 or potentially even older. There may also be pressure to review the so-called triple lock that guarantees increased state pension, which our grandparents, Thomas and Sarah, will certainly have benefited from in the last 10 years. The issue is that meaning that maintaining the triple lock is expensive. State pension costs around 100 billion in 2018-19, which is almost half of the social benefit budget. There have been calls for the government to scrap the 2.5 increased element and instead have a double lock system, which would mean increases with a higher of inflation or average earnings each year. And finally, capital gains tax, an area where your accountants will undoubtedly guide you, but we need to factor in for investment planning. One big change would definitely impact Peter and Claire would be the further changes to entrepreneurs relief. The Resolution Foundation called Entrepreneurs Relief the worst of Britain's tax reliefs, as it's expensive, ineffective and aggressive, their words. We've already seen a reduction in the lifetime allowance for Entrepreneurs Relief from 10 million to a million back in March. Any further changes could impact Peter and Claire's position if they do decide to sell the business. Capital gains itself could also be in the mix for changes. Currently, capital gains tax rates are far lower than income tax rates, so we could see a move to bring capital gains rates in line with income tax rates. Whilst this could further impact Peter and Claire's sale proceeds, their ICES and pensions would not be impacted because they grow capital gains tax free. So to conclude, it's inevitable really that we'll see some changes to the tax landscape during the client's lifetime. Some may be negative, but actually some of them may be positive. I think regular reviews of investments and planning strategies really is beneficial. Now over to Natalie to consider the family law side of things. Thank you, Helen. Um, the family law framework that we operate in is pretty well established and we are unlikely to see any significant changes anytime soon. Divorce law itself may change as Parliament has long been considering the introduction of a no-fault divorce. At the moment, couples must wait either two years to get divorced without blaming the other or alternatively rely on the grounds of adultery or unreasonable behaviour if they wish to divorce immediately. We're also unlikely to see a situation whereby prenuptial agreements become automatically binding in this country as they are in some European countries, but case law has given them increasing weight, meaning that it's still better to have one than not if there is a disparity in wealth when going into a marriage. Where we are seeing changes in family law is the ways in which couples are reaching agreements with regards to their finances on divorce. Forms of alternative dispute re resolution have been gaining momentum in recent years and with the current pandemic we expect that to accelerate further, given that we're already seeing delays in the court timetable. As well as the more traditional solicitor negotiations, mediation and the court process, we've seen an increase in the use of arbitration and private FDRs or early indication hearings. Arbitration is essentially employing a specially trained arbitrator to hear the case and make a decision rather like a private judge. The benefits of this are that the parties have much more control over the timetable, they can choose their arbitrator and the case can be personally managed and timetabled by that arbitrator. This is unlike the court whereby you often have a different judge for each hearing, proceedings can be very slow particularly in the current situation, whereas with arbitration cases are private, they can be timetabled by the parties and they are often resolved much more quickly. An arbitration decision, which is called an award, is binding on the parties and the decision is final, just like a judgment at final hearing. 
This is a positive if the parties want to resolve things quickly and definitively, and it does away with the traditional three-stage court process. However, if parties don't want to go that far, they can opt for a private FDR or early indication hearing. This involves appointing a senior solicitor or barrister to sit as a private judge. The FDR is the middle hearing in the court process. It stands for Financial Dispute Resolution Hearing and it's often referred to as the negotiation hearing. It's an opportunity for both parties to set out their cases and receive indications from a judge, whether that be a court judge or a private judge, as to how the case should settle. The decision isn't binding, but rather the idea is that it should aid negotiations and help parties to reach an agreement. The point is that we are seeing a definite move away from the traditional court process, as there are much, many more imaginative ways for parties to reach an agreement without going to court that gives them more control and there's usually a different option, so there's something to suit everyone. That pretty much wraps up what we wanted to talk to you about, about possible future changes in our respective fields. And I'll now pass back to Helen and Moira to wrap things up. Thank you, Natalie. And um, that just about concludes our webinar. Thank you very much indeed for continuing to follow us over the weeks. And we hope, oh, as all of us, um, we hope you've enjoyed these um, as much as we've enjoyed presenting them. If you do have any questions, however simple or technical, then please do not hesitate to get in touch. How about a final word from you, Moira? Sure, thanks, Helen. And to everyone who's taken part uh, and watched today, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure sharing our family story with you in this series of webinars, and I hope that we've addressed some of the issues that might have been keeping you awake at night in recent months. Uh, in closing, I'd just like one more time, if I can, to refer you to the three steps of the financial planning process that we've used in these sessions to guide us along the way, and which actually reflect the way that we all work. First, take the time now to fully understand your current position, your options, and their implications. Then, once you're fully informed, you can plan with confidence. And finally, remember to review as circumstances can and do change, as we've highlighted today. Financial planning is a multifaceted and continuous activity, and decisions in one area inevitably impact on others. So an integrated approach is vital. And that's really what the Bradness Personal Initiative is all about and seeks to address, and why it's important for your accountants, your solicitors, and your financial planners all to work together to support you. And hopefully we've shown you how that works in practice. As financial planners, it's our job, or part of our job at least, to bring some focus and a bit of energy to your planning. And I hope I've managed to do that over the last six weeks. And as Duncan said at the beginning, please do come back to us now with your questions. We'll answer them in detail. Or if you need any further guidance, you can contact us direct. And do also subscribe to our news. And that way you'll be invited to future webinars and events like this. But for now, stay safe and well. And thanks everyone for watching. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.